All right. <clears throat> this is lesson 12 of the voice of God. We're still dealing with his glorious voice. Thank God it's a glorious voice. It's not just a voice. But uh, we are dealing also with ways of proving the voice of God. And to me, this is one of the most important lessons. These lessons on proving the voice of God. One of the uh, most important portions of this, this course. Uh, basically because almost anything in the church has gone for the voice of God. And we've had some pretty strange stuff. In my 50 years of ministry, I have heard uh, quite a few things attributed to God that didn't belong to him at all. <laughs> so let's... <clears throat> the Lord establishes his word in 1 Samuel 1 and 23. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth good to thee. Tarry until thou hast weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she had weaned him. By the way, that could have been anywhere in those days, anywhere from, say, nine to ten months or a year, up to five years. So we're not sure what age she brought him to the tabernacle and uh, to Eli's care. But uh, many today are trying to make the word of the Lord happen in their lives. Either they have received or been given a word of the Lord. They try to force God's hand. Sometimes they try it in prayer. Sometimes they try and set up the circumstances. And then they are upset because it doesn't work. And they blame God. One of the things that uh, that I really feel is, is happening is uh, we hear a prophetic word and we put assumptions on its fulfillment. And therefore, out of our assumptions, rather than going back to God and saying, now, Lord, would you explain this or would you uh, give me clear interpretation of this dream or this vision? We just assume we know. And as we saw earlier, there is the ministry of an interpreter. And sometimes we need one. So when they do, at best, they produce an abortion or a premature birth. Either of these is something too small to function properly or, and requires more care than usual either the premature or the abortion. Sometimes a premature baby or ministry does not survive the trauma of either the birth or the first few days or hours of life. When my, uh, I had an older sister, and I only know this by hearsay because it happened before I was born, but she was born alive but died in two hours. And I don't know Nobody told us whether it was premature. But these things, when we try and force God, these type of things happen. And then we blame God because the word didn't come to pass. Rather than saying, as Elkanah, or as Hannah did, let the Lord, or, yeah, it was Elkanah said, uh... You, you let the Lord establish his word. If it's the word of the Lord, and my heart is right, and my attitude is right, and I just keep walking the way I'm walking, because God hasn't said to change direction, then his word will come to pass. Because I'm walking in obedience today, when I get to the time of that word coming to pass, I will be in obedience, therefore release the word of the Lord and the fulfillment of that word. In Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. In 2 Samuel 7 and 25. Your notes are on your table. <laughs> uh, and now, O Lord, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever. And do as thou hast said. In other words, 
even though he believed it to be the word of the Lord, he handed it back to God to fulfill in God's time. And he walked in obedience today. There, I can't overemphasize the day-to-day -day obedience because that usually brings us into fulfillment of every condition a prophetic word has. By the way, prophetic words have conditions. Very few in the scriptures have no condition. If thou wilt, I will. If thou wilt, I will. And, you know, I, when I was studying this out, I came to Abraham, and it seemed like there were no conditions. But here's what the Lord showed me. He said, because I know he will command his children after me, I'm going to do this for Abraham. What does that mean? The condition of the fulfillment of the prophetic word was teaching his children to walk with God. Because I know he will command his children after me, then I'm going to do this for Abraham. And sometimes because it's not worded with an if, <laughs> we often um, don't think there are conditions. I know when I taught this at the college, they looked at me because in the, in the about uh, about 65% of my students were from the Caribbean. And down there they have profit this and profit that. And sometimes it's non-profit this and non-profit that. Um, and the word, they would just give words and none of them would come to pass, but they still call themselves profit. That's a non-profit situation. If okay. it... Huh? What if, uh, what if uh, when you are given a word by somebody and there is no condition attached that God says... You, you go back and ask God for the condition. Because almost every word you read in Scripture has condition with it. See, and we're not just looking at certain Scriptures, we're looking at the overall attitude of God in the prophetic. That's what people do not necessarily see. There's, it's not just this scripture, that scripture, the other scripture, but often there's an attitude that is given on any given subject when you follow that theme from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And by the way, did I tell you how I found out all this stuff? I had a church, my first church, back in 1971. I went to the church, and they all said they were prophets. Well, I was a green pastor, but I knew they weren't all prophets. So I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, study every scripture on prophets and prophecy in the scriptures. Now, back then, we didn't have computers. There was no fast way for this. Yeah. What, we had, what I had was a Bible, a notebook, and strong concordance. And I searched it from Genesis to Revelation. That's when, and, and then I wrote down the scriptures in the notebook and left some space between each of them. And then I went back to the Holy Spirit and I said, now, I've done my homework. I need some help. And what I did was, I then went through the scriptures and I heard God say, this is the principle for this scripture. Then after that, I gathered together the ones that, had, that belonged to the same principle. So it was an extensive study. It took me quite a few weeks. But then when I got up and preached or taught as gently as I could, the church cleared out. I only had one the next Sunday. And God began to rebuild it from that point. So when I say there's an overall, that's how I learned to study. I went to Bible school, but they don't teach you how to study the Bible. They teach you how to study the doctrine books. 
or psychology or counseling or any of those other things. And my, I, I left Bible school because there wasn't uh, enough Bible in the school. It said Bible school, but they had all these other subjects. Other subjects yeah. the, the things that the Holy Spirit is supposed to lead you in. <laughs> okay. So uh, when I was talking to uh, Pastor Matt and Pastor Ken the other day, I said to them, the school here is good. They need to get their foundation in the leading of the Spirit first before they begin to go into doctrine. Because if they're founded in hearing God's voice, they'll be able to sort through. But if they can't hear God's voice, they're going to listen to the teacher or the denomination or whoever it is, and their relationship will not be directly with God. It will be through an organization, a pre preacher, a pastor. They'll pray, but they'll come to church and whatever the pastor says, they'll do. Instead of taking it back to God and say, does this apply to me? Or how does this word pastor minister apply to me? How do you want me to apply it? Okay? So it's important, very important, that we hear the word of the Lord and are able to hear the voice of God. That's the first thing new Christians should learn. The voice of their father. Okay? Now, in 1 Kings 6 and 12, concerning this house which thou art building, if, oh, there's one of those conditions. You notice I capitalized that. If thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then... Will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father? Solomon, now, I don't know a whole bunch about this, okay? But Solomon inherited prophetic word that was to be fulfilled in his lifetime that his father had received. Let me give you another illustration of that, because that, that's kind of a, a rocker. The very fact that we can inherit something that wasn't given to us initially. Elijah on Mount Horeb, when the, he had that meeting with God and heard the still small voice, was given three commandments, three things to do. He only did one of them. And yet he went, didn't he? I mean, he went live to heaven. So it isn't that he disobeyed, one of the first things Elisha did after he came back across the Jordan was fulfill those two commandments. He inherited instruction that had been given to his spiritual father. Now, what are those? That, that, that one takes some searching out and saying, Lord, because you see, if I'm in a local assembly, and there are words that God has given to the local assembly, possibly in former generations. That doesn't stop with the change of pastor. God has given that word to an assembly for their destiny in the area. And I believe that's where this church is at. I believe we're coming into what God had spoken years ago. We're coming into the time of fulfillment for many of those words. That's why I have taken the approach I have in training people how to pray proper. Pray into the word. He said, Paul said to Timothy, war good warfare with the prophecies that have gone out over thee. And I asked the students the other day, I said, if I haven't got any prophecy, have I got, am I armed? The churches that do not allow prophecy are in a bind spiritually for spiritual warfare. We'll just leave that one there and move on. <laughs> okay. 
Why some words don't come to pass. One of the things that is so often forgotten in the reading and receiving of prophecy is the conditions. Because that there needs to be attention paid to the ifs of scripture and especially of the prophetic scripture and prophetic utterance. Both the logos and the rhema. The logos is the written word. The rhema is the spoken personal word to you, either God speaking it in your own spirit prophetically or God speaking it through a prophet into your life prophetically. Now, I'm not talking about uh, words that come from the gift of prophecy. I'm talking about prophetic office, which usually deals with deeper things, more detail than uh, the gift of prophecy and has more authority in God, actually. Now, without fulfilled conditions, prophets, prophecies are static. They cannot be fulfilled because fulfilled conditions alone release prophetic fulfillment. In other words, if I fulfill, that's why I focus in my working with people and counseling them who've received prophetic word. I focus on them understanding the conditions because if they fulfill the conditions, it cannot help to come to pass. Because they're walking in obedience, aren't they? And obedience releases the power and hand of God. Okay? Fulfilled conditions alone release prophetic fulfillment. The revelation of God himself in the, in the word. This is one of the things that really helped me. Because being in out, outside of denominational structure for so many years, I needed something to help me discern whether a word was really from God or not. Okay? And by the way, the soul can mimic and look like the anointing. You, the soul of man can. Now, in, in 1948, there came a phenomenal move of God. Uh, God released Billy Graham. God released Oral Roberts. God released uh, William Branham. And he released prophetic son prophetic sound as well okay but in 1956 that all began to fall away because they tried to organize everything okay and when they did they began to put limitations on things when they did that people began to prophesy out of their soul uh, I, I was in a church, I was a child, but I was in a church at the time where the power of God was phenomenal. There were some services, we'd come to church for service, get in the door and fall flat in our face because of the presence of God. Okay? And there were some meetings, there was no singing, no preaching, just presence. And people were healed and saved and whole nine yards because of the presence. Okay, so, and I, by the way, I believe that's returning to the church. But because they begin to put restrictions on things, I begin, you know, as a, I, I think I was 10 through 12 when I began to see this, I saw, because I've been brought up in the presence, I recognized when the presence was there. And I would walk into the meetings and see the same manifestation but no presence. And early, early in my walk with God, I said, Lord, what is this? He says, the soul has mimicked the spirit. I said, what do you mean? He said, turn to Hebrews 4 and 12. The, uh, just let me get my Bible here. I, would, I didn't plan on going here, but <clears throat> I think maybe we need to. Hebrews 4 and 12. There are times when it's good to have, <laughs> and when you get to my age, it's good to have a large print one. <laughs> okay, Hebrews 4, and, and you know, part of our problem is we know the scripture too well. You know what I mean? We can quote it, but we don't hear it. 
For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two, two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of what? Oh, you mean there needs to be a line drawn. And without the word of the Lord, I can't draw that line properly and in balance. And of the thought uh, joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the what? Thoughts and intents or attitudes of the heart. And so the, there's a, it's important that we see this because I have been around, uh, what, three major moves of God. One revival and two times of refreshing. So is it the, is it the soul that is descending the water? Or? Well, let, let me put it this way. Uh, in 1972, 73, I went to some meetings, and of course, because I went to Elam for uh, my year of Bible school, I knew about the prophetic, and I, you know, and I watched as God moved phenomenally, and then it, it's like one of my uh, mentors said this, he said, and he was, he was a high-level prophetic voice, accurate, clear, excellent in the word he said one he was in one meeting and he said and again this is going to date me okay he said i was watching and it was like someone was doing the film strips do you remember film strips yeah most folks wouldn't know what film strips were <laughs> and he said i i was reading the prophetic word that so and so that someone was speaking and then I came to a blank uh, slide, and they kept talking. The, the person kept, quote, prophesying. And then he said, uh, the next slide, there was something on it, and that's what they were saying. There was a mixture. And you see, prophecy is the only thing clearly said to be judged. Let one prophesy, let another judge. What is the blank about? The blank is it was coming out of their soul. That's why this scripture says discern between soul and spirit. Okay? Part One of the things I learned teaching in a charismatic Bible school or a charismatic college and going, you know, being invited to the churches because I was a professor at the college. And I would listen, and I would really, in my spirit, see the same thing. Somebody would prophesy, and this much of it would be good, and the rest of it was the soul. And if we don't learn how to discern that and hear from God and take forth the precious from the vial, then we're, we're going to go wrong somewhere along the line. That's why I often tell people there's no substitute for knowing this. None. All right. And the Lord, 1 Samuel 3 and 21, the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed who? Himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. A careful examination of this passage would show us that there's a revelation of the Lord himself through a true word of the Lord. An earmark of anything <clears throat> that God speaks is there's a revelation of himself when he speaks. The word, I'm, even though it may be a word of direction to me, someone gives me a word and it's a word of direction to me. If I can see his nature and his character in the word, I can be pretty sure it's solid. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> to me, this is one of the most important scriptures that I've ever studied. <coughs> Note the difference between Moses and the children of Israel. In Psalm 103, verse 7, he made known his 
ways under Moses and his acts under the children of Israel. Moses saw something of God himself in everything that God said. Remember, God wants to reveal himself to us. But that means we, it's, he starts from a hidden place. And in order for him to reveal himself to us, there needs to be a pressing in and a desiring of that relationship. Moses was focused on learning of God, not on learning the things of God, but of God. Jesus, standing up on that last great day of the feast, invited the weary and heavy laden to come unto me and rest and learn of me. Not learn of miracles, signs and wonders, not learn of, of ministry, not learn of good works, learn of me. This journey with God is a journey of learning him. <clears throat> He was carrying on the burden of the Father that men and women might learn of him. In our receiving of the word of the Lord, we must realize that we're still on a learning curve. I start to die when I stop learning. So don't you ever stop learning. All right. God has much concerning his ways to teach us. But the children of Israel were only concerned about the acts of God. Too many people are focused on signs, wonders, and miracles, and are not learning the ways, or one of the other ways of translating that is the whys of God. Why does God allow things to happen? I've had a number of people recently asking me questions of deep things they're going through. And I go to God and I say, God, First of all, where are you taking them? That makes a difference now. Where God's taking you. The, what is, and this, another question is, what is the vehicle of them reaching their destiny? If God called me to be a prophet and I want to be an apostle, I will miss my destiny. Not because the ministry is the destiny, but the ministry is the vehicle to the destiny. I often say the ministry is the toolbox to do a work in me so I can be like Jesus. And if I'm coveting something that's not mine, then I'm going to be in trouble, aren't I? Even if it is something good, ministry, function, giftings, I need to know the unique combination that God is giving for me to bring me to him. And bring me to his character and nature. Our conclusion from this point then is every true word of the Lord will somehow reveal the Lord of the word to us. If there's no revelation of him, it's not a word of the Lord. In Psalm 12 verse 6, the word of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified. I don't like this scripture, by the way. Seven times. And the reason I don't like it is I think I only need to go through it once. <laughs> but. <coughs> Seven is a number of completion. Yeah. Our heart goes out to those who do not understand the ways of spiritual warfare. Often they get caught in backlash of the enemy's response to the word of the Lord. After we've received a word from the Lord, the enemy will attack to try and regain the territory he lost in you as you received, not just heard, but received that it was a word from the Lord. I'm not speaking of hearing the words. I'm speaking of receiving the word. And there's a difference. Wish I had time to go into some of that, but I don't. Okay. Hebrews 11 and 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. And by the way, this is one of the most important things that I can take hold of. Because we've got the faith message out there that, that says, believe, believe, believe. 
And sometimes what God speaks to us is so far off our charts that we can't see how it's possible. And so the enemy condemns us for not believing. But watch this process because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Now, because this is in reference to Old Testament people, we kind of pass over it to get to the good stuff. And we miss the ways of God in the passage. Having seen the promises afar off, these men and women had the vision for the future. They were not sure whether it was their future or not, but they had a vision and responded to it. Case in point, Abraham. It says <clears throat> there are several things we learn when we study his life from Genesis all the way through to the end. Okay? I mean the end of the book, not just the end of his life. Because in Acts it says the God of glory appeared unto Abraham. Abraham when he was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans, saw some form of the glory of God. But you don't learn that till the book of Acts. And then in Hebrews, it says, he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. You don't read that in Genesis. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, can I say something? Yeah. With regard to the head one and received one, the head, the received one would be the one you have applied, correct? The, the, pardon me. This is the anchor, okay? Isaiah, I believe it is, if it says, if it speaks not according to this word, and I think we come to that later on in our teaching, but... There is the, the rhema word of God can be you reading this and all of a sudden it coming alive to you. Okay? I want to make that clear because that's how most of our Baptist friends get a word from the Lord. They wouldn't say it was the Holy Spirit. They would just say it came alive. They wouldn't say it was prophetic. It just, it just witnessed to my spirit. They use all those words that are safe Baptist words. You know, within their doctrine. But God's... I mean, I've listened to Chuck Swindoll. That man gets phenomenal revelation that you don't hear from any other preachers. I've listened to David, David Jeremiah. I call him a prophet of the outer court because some of the stuff he has is excellent. But then the Pentecostal just set those guys aside because they don't speak in tongues. That's not the issue. The issue is, is your spirit witnessing to the word they're preaching? It then becomes a rhema word to you. The guy sitting beside you might not witness to the same thing. It's not a rhema word to him. I need to hear God's voice, however he speaks. And sometimes he uses... Well, if he can use an ass, he can use people. But no, and if, he, if he can use an ass, he can use anything he wants to use. I have got to allow for that. And the witness of the spirit within helps me sort through that between a Logos word and a Rhema word. Okay? So here's the verse I want us to, portion of the verse I want us to see. Because I think this will help us. The second point is they were persuaded of the, of the vision they saw. Wait a minute. Let me go back to Abraham. Abraham never saw the city, did he? But he's in it. Who persuaded Abraham? He didn't have a book. As far as we know, there was no writing at the time. Those who talk about Job say he was a contemporary with Abraham. So Job wasn't written yet. Are you following me? 
Who persuaded them? More than that, the heavens declare and the firmament shows his handiwork. They not only heard from God within, but they were persuaded by the things. See, wrong, turn to Romans 1 and 20. It's a phenomenal passage of scripture. Romans 1 and verse 20. For the invisible things of him, God himself, from the creation of the world are what? Clearly seen. How are they understood? Being understood by the things that are made, how far does that go? Even to his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. If Listen. There are Arabs today, Muslims, there are Hindus, there and, and, and many, many others that God is appearing to. They don't have the book. But who's persuading them that Jesus is the Savior? <coughs> he is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God persuaded them that the vision was real. And I want to underline that needing to persuade someone suggests, at the very least, that there was a measure of resistance to hearing and believing the message at first. But God was so in love with them that he took the time necessary to persuade them. Now, last week you looked at Gideon. Think for a moment. If someone asked that many times, we'd be ready to bop them off. Yeah. <laughs> and yet God never once remonstrated Gideon for needing to be convinced. In fact, God, when he knew that Gideon was afraid to ask anymore, said, Gideon, if, notice God, that, if you're still having a problem, go down, take your servant, or take a witness, and go down to the enemy's camp. And when you get there, I'll persuade you. God gave an ungodly, unsaved man a dream and gave his partner in the tent the interpretation. We're the ones that put the limitations on who God speaks to. But Gideon knew that God was speaking through those two unsaved, ungodly people. Anyway, I like that one. Number three, after being persuaded of the promises, they embraced them. This means that they took them as their own. No longer did they say the promises were for others, but not them. They claimed the promises spoken to them by God as their own. This step is essential if we are to progress to a receiving of the word. The receiving the word is more than hearing the words it is understanding and receiving as our own the spirit of the words being spoken. Okay? Number four, an absolute necessary step in the solidifying of the process is to confess that these promises are not only true, but they're true for me. They're my promises. See, they embrace them. They took them into their own heart and their own spirit. There's something about confession of a truth at the right time, in the right place, that solidifies something within the confessor. Now, there are people who have taken the book and confessed the book, but they've not received it as rhema, and so it doesn't work. Then they blame who? God or the preacher? Because they're not, they're taught that if it's in here, it's yours. Every promise in the book is mine. Well, some of them I don't want. <laughs>
I want the I want the good ones. I want the ones for those that are obedient. I definitely don't want the ones for those that are disobedient. Okay. When I embrace the truth in this manner, I can expect a counterattack by the enemy in my soul. He will appeal to the portion of flesh that the current truth is aggravating and try to use that venue to retake the land he's lost. Every time you receive a word from the Lord, not in your head, but in your heart, the enemy loses ground in you. Therefore, the, all the rules of war, all the wars I've ever seen and watched on TV and read about, there's always a counterattack. But in Christianity, we never think of that. Consequently, we get caught up in the battle of the enemy in our minds saying, hath God said. Now, he's going to send that no matter what. But if I get begin to think along those lines, when I know in my spirit, and there's been the witness in my spirit that something is true, then I can be dissuaded and I can, I can uh, be wounded in the war. I need to embrace it, confess it, and say, okay, God, it's up to you. There's going to be a counterattack. For every step you take, there's going to be resistance. When Israel came into the promised land, they transitioned from a welfare mentality to a warfare mentality. Everything they got in the promised land, they got by warfare. And if we're coming into the promises of God being fulfilled, guess what? We're coming into a time of warfare. I didn't say I like it. I don't like confrontation. I don't like warfare. I got no choice. If I'm on God's team, I'm going to be attacked. Okay? Therefore, I need to learn how to defend myself. When the word of the Lord really gets into our being, God himself allows it to be tried. He tries it in a furnace. This furnace is your earthen vessel. Psalm 12 and verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. One of the problems in the church today is that they have not learned the ways of God. Therefore, they're surprised by a number of these things. There are two ways of perceiving God, by observing the things that he does or allows and drawing our understanding of God from those things, or by learning through what he does and what he speaks, his ways. It's the difference between understanding something and being mentored. The mentor takes you through and tells you why, doesn't he? We're being mentored by God. Hallelujah. <laughs> These two approaches are outlined in Psalm 103 and verse 7. He made known his ways unto Moses and his acts unto the children of Israel. This defines much of the church today. Many are satisfied with the acts of God. They say God is here because people are being healed, people are being saved. And I'm not saying there isn't a level of God there, a measure of God there, because you can't come to God, and can't come to Jesus unless the Father draw you. But the acts of God will not produce the nature of God in you. There's a company of people who desire to know the ways of God. The people who join this company are rare in comparison. Well, what was the ratio? One to two million? Two million children of Israel partaking of the acts of God and one who wanted to know his ways. And Moses transitioned from being a servant of God to being a friend of God. Why? Because he didn't, he was not satisfied with just signs, wonders, and miracles. He wanted to know the whys of God. There is a certain attitude that needs to be expressed while walking through the acts and speakings of God. It's the attitude described in the following passage of Scripture. 
These passages lay out the steps to receiving the word with gladness. James 1 and 12. Wherefore, lay apart all, lay, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Receive the, with meekness the engrafted. By the way, neither of you guys have tattoos, do you? Tattoos. What happens with the tattoo? They engrave it in your skin. And it's terrible if you have to have it removed. Almost impossible, you're right. Now, listen carefully. God says you are graven on the palm of his hand. One of the most sensitive areas of the body. He says our heart is to be tattooed with the word of God. That can only be done by the spirit. Uh, Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 3 talks about the word being what? Written on the fleshly tables of your heart. It's one thing to know it here. It's another thing to have it here. The ones that I have here, I can remember the reference to. The ones that I have here, I can't. I can just remember the content. <laughs> but it took an experience of God in which that, that um, word was tattooed in my heart. Now, receiving the engrafted word involves the steps we've already delineated in Hebrews 11:13. Here's the review. Seeing the promises afar off, being persuaded of them, persuaded by God, not by man, not by prophets, not by apostles, but by God himself. Then I embrace the promise I'm persuaded of, confessing my relationship to the promises. They are now mine. They're not somebody else's. They're not just for the whole body of Christ, they're mine. <coughs> Five, confessing my promises and my relationship to the, to the world because of the promises I've embraced. The promises of God will separate me from the world. So let's pray. Father, thank you that you show us how to prove the word we've received. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is leading a people to a deeper relationship with you through his voice speaking to us. Each speaking releases into us, if we receive it, more of your glory changing us into the image of the Son. Thank you so much. Help us perceive properly the word we receive. Give us grace to actually receive in our being the word that you speak and we hear. Only you can show us how, and thank you that you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is some lesson. I really, really enjoy, both enjoy teaching it, because I've enacted a lot of it in my life. I've said, God, you persuade me. There's so many voices out there. You persuade me. And you know something? He's faithful because that's what he wants to do. We don't have to walk around, you know, if it be thy will, that always got me. <laughs> All right.